Hi, and welcome to Doing the Opposite Business Disruptors, the podcast where you get to meet people who are not afraid to stand up and call out bad practice or injustice. People who own their mistakes, they thrive from challenges, and who ultimately choose only to see the summit and not the mountain. I'm Jeff Dewey. I'm an entrepreneur, the author of best-selling book, Doing the Opposite, and a keynote and masterclass speaker. Today, you're going to be Maura Aaron's Mealy. Now, Maura is somebody that I'm familiar with. I appeared on her podcast last year, um, and her specialty subject is surrounding her latest book called The Anxious Achiever. It's about people that are high achievers that suffer anxiety. Now, Maura, she's, she's a movement builder. Um, she's an expert in helping people talk about the hard stuff. Um, Maura knows that taking your mental health seriously um, is the leadership strength. She hosts the Anxious Achiever podcast for LinkedIn Presents, which won the 2023 Media Award from Mental Health America and was also the 2020 Webby Awards honoree, 2022 Best Commute Podcast Signal Award winner and is frequently a top 10 management podcast and top 50 business podcast. She's passionate about helping people rethink the relationship between their mental health and their own success. So, hi, Border. Welcome to the show. I'm so glad that you could join us from uh, across the pond, and um, I'm really looking forward to uh, today's conversation. Same here, Jeff. I loved having you on on my podcast. <laughs> Brilliant. So, Maura, can we just start? For the benefit of, of the audience, perhaps you could just give us a whistle-stop tour of, of Maura, what, what, what Maura does, what her purpose in life is, and, um, and try and give us an understanding about you know, what it is that gets you out of bed every day, what is it that drives you? So I am driven by the idea that people can be happier at work, basically. I always have been. I wanted to be a workplace therapist when I was... 27 years old, 28 years old, 29 years old. I'm 47 now. And I came up in the early internet working at the first sort of dot coms uh, that were around in 1999 onwards. And that was really exciting. And then I worked in US politics, which was a passion of mine, applying what I had learned working in dot coms. And through it all, I had to manage my own mental health, which was very up and down and very dramatic at times. And, you know, that was back in the days before we had mentorship and teaching people how to be leaders and work-life balance. It was just a very different world back then. I'm sure you remember. And I really struggled. And I think I reached a point when I was on my like 10th job in my third country in my fifth U.S. state where I just thought, gosh, maybe maybe work is also a problem. (laughs) You know, I clearly am not thriving, but work is a problem. And I thought, gosh, what if I could help people understand themselves so that they could work in ways that suited their temperament, their personality, their character, so that they could do the best they could And that was what I wanted to do. But for whatever reason, um, I went to graduate school to become a clinical social worker so that I could be a therapist. I also got my master's at Harvard in public administration. You know, I I never was able to make that dream possible because financially I really needed to earn money. So I kept doing my political consulting and I started a business and it was amazing. Mm -hmm. And that was called Women Online. And I sold that business two years ago. And I thought, this is the time. You know, mm-hmm. this is the time. And so for about a year and a half now, I've been really working on my passion, which is better mental health at work and helping people figure out how to work in the way that their brain needs them to work. So during that journey, it's almost like you always knew what you wanted, but you had to wait until that time when you felt it was sustainable for you as an individual to be able to drive. It's hence why you sold your business and you, you say that's now time. But during your things you've learned, what, what common threads have you seen 
with people or organizations that you speak to when you're trying to break down these barriers of how to how to think, how to manage your own expectation? Expectation, you just hit it. You just yeah. hit it. Expectations are a huge factor that are just often completely ignored and left undiscussed. And that creates a tremendous amount of anxiety. So my specialty is helping anxious leaders, anxious teams. And what I've learned, so so in all the time that I was writing about and blogging about and podcasting about workplace mental health, I was a consultant and I was working inside large organizations of all different kinds, the world's largest organizations. And there were two themes that emerged. And I think that they're really, really important. The first is that people don't understand expectations. They don't understand their own expectations, which are often stories we've been telling ourselves since we were kids, that we've internalized other people's expectations. You know, we're driven by invisible expectations that stress us out often and make us really anxious. We don't understand other people's expectations of us. No one ever tells us what does good look like? <laughs> what does as soon as possible means like really basic stuff, but also fundamental stuff, right? What does it mean to be part of a team? What's our goal here? You, you, I'm shocked at how many companies I work in, really famous companies, where people are just sort of like milling around, not aligned because nobody has expectations clear. And then also, what do I expect? What do I expect of other people? And are they on target? And are they just constantly leading me to disappointment or micromanagement or controlling behavior or confusion? And then the second piece is this culture of urgency that I, as someone who had my first job when email was just starting, and now I'm working in the world of Slack and, you know, constant constant communication has has just, I think, become a crisis and is really ruining people's ability to function at work well. The reason I'm fascinated about this subject is because I've, as a leader and running a, quite a reasonable sized business, I've stumbled across some stuff because we're all wired. We're all wired from our parents' expectation, command and control, and you've got to show strength and, you know, the leaders expect to have all the answers, all those things that we've all been taught, right? Until the penny drops and you start engaging different types of people. So in my case, I joined a peer group um, with that statement that everyone's heard, cliche, it's very lonely at the top. Who do you talk to? Who do you really confide in? You can't confide in your teams. Half the time, you can't even confide in your partner or your wife. So who do you talk to about these things that are, are experiencing similar things? So the peer group became a big issue. for me. But then what happened is during the journey, I suddenly became fascinated by how people behave, how they respond. Um, what makes them feel safe? What makes them th- you know, flourish? What What are the things that do that rather than me giving expectation? And one of the things that really shone a light, and I'd learned a lot of stuff which I was putting into practice, but what really shone a light was COVID mm. because something happened. Everyone was sent home. And what happened when everyone got sent home? They had the time to do something. They'd never been given the time or never taken the time. That was to reflect, to mm-hmm. think. What is it that I want out of life? You know, because people just never had the time to do that. And that suddenly had an impact where I watched businesses and leaders coming on the so-called great resignation. You know, these people are leaving because they can get jobs anywhere now and it's just ridiculous, they're greedy. And, and again, you're all getting it wrong. It's got nothing to do with greed. It's to do with how do I live a life that makes me happy? It's not about money. It's not about um, whether I like the leader or the boss, of course, all that comes to play. But it was about, you know, what is it that I actually want to get out of life? Because people just don't get the time. So what then happened, we did something that was very courageous and brave, and we just said, let the people decide. Mm-hmm. Talk to us, communicate, 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 three most important words in business, um, and have conversations that you'd have with your kids or your family or your brother or your sister. Why is it that we behave differently at work than we do when we're at home? Why, why don't we behave in exactly the same way? Because life's about relationship. And it, that suddenly, for me and for business, some businesses, it accelerated our drive to creating this workplace environment that was as safe and as happy, in most cases, as the home environment. Because you didn't have this fear of saying what you believe, saying what you thought. Um, and, a, and a little story I want to share with you is 
one of my members of my family is a carer, and in our in our in the in the UK, caring is not particularly a uh, um, mm-hmm. a, a sought after industry because it's low paid. Yeah. Um, Same it's here. Long hours. Yeah. It's challenging. Yeah. So it, it, it's 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 not a good place. But when you're a carer and you care, you you want to make a difference. So even in the care industry, you have this top down approach that's about revenue, finance, profit, EBITDA, et cetera, et cetera. And these carers don't get the opportunity to share ways and means of doing things more effectively because the leadership shuts them down and says, no, no, this is, you know, and you see, God, they, these companies are missing out on so much. I, okay, there's a few things I want to say to that. I agree with you that COVID was a forcing function for us to change so many things. You know, and the truth is, and I only have U.S. data, most people are very engaged at work. Actually, people are more engaged at work now than they ever have been before. So something about the way that we've begun working since COVID has made knowledge workers happier. And I think it's pretty clear that that's flexibility, (laughs) you know? Um, And so that's the good news. The other thing is that um, I saw a a recent survey um, I think it was from Gallup or SHRM, I can't remember, Society for Human Resource Management. I think it was from Gallup. 60% of Americans are happy at work. They like their community. They feel that they have purpose. Again, that's really positive. And so I don't want to discount the positive because I think also what we learned during the pandemic is that we rely on each other at work. Our communities and our relationships at work are hella important. <laughs> And so I think that's really important to think about. But at the same time, levels of burnout globally are increasing. Mental health globally is decreasing. We see a huge crisis among younger people, young adults especially, reporting extremely high rates of depression and anxiety and and hopelessness. And so that's also happening. And so I think this is a, a situation where two things can be true where we've we've been doing a lot of things better and yet we're also doing a lot of things really wrong both systemically and individually in how we manage people. And it's interesting because I want to get context for my audience because I talk a lot about this stuff. Because in the UK only 11% of workers are engaged. Wow. That was up to 2021. Across the globe only 20% of people are engaged when you're surveying 160,000 people from 54 different countries. And I use that information, not as a shockwave, but a realistic reality check that says, guys, you know, in in the UK, 89% of people do not want to be where they are. That's a problem. And if they don't want to be where they are, that's got to drive anxiety. It's got to drive depression. It's got to drive all those things. So therefore, if we don't realize that that's the problem we have to solve first, then we're all barking up the wrong tree. And the same applies to globally from the Gallup survey in 2022. Now, what I do know, although I've not seen the survey yet from a UK perspective, what I do know is that if I look at my business and businesses like mine, where people have been given the freedom, and I use freedom in in two ways. In, In our business, freedom is so, so important, but you cannot give freedom without clarity. That's right. Otherwise, you get chaos, right? So as long as you've got absolute clarity on the outcomes that we're all agreeing and negotiating to achieve, then you get the freedom to achieve. Um, But what I talk about with the human psyche, what does every human being want and need? Um, They need autonomy, they need mastery, and they need purpose. And if you can nourish those three things in the right way, then you get a happy person by default. They need to control or influence their destiny. And then they bring their whole selves to work or to the projects, or whatever the case may be. But when I see different surveys going on in the UK where they say, um, statistics have revealed that the optimum time is three days in the office and two days at home. I go, really? And it's, it's like these narratives and these little pockets no, of information. It's so because wrong. Because what I say, I know, I know. And then they say, and then this company say, right, we've, we're now investigating and trialing a four-day week. I see they go, look, Guys, you're missing the pr- the primary issue. The second you constrain somebody, you're removing elements or totality of freedom. And by default, you put them straight back into the same space. You've got to let them manage their lives and trust the fact that they will deliver the outcomes you've agreed because people are very clever. 
people are very clever. And, you know, for there's um, there's been a survey in the U.S. of working Americans for over 40 years and year on year what it shows it's called the National Employment Survey is that autonomy and agency are more important to most workers than a pay raise to your yeah. point I'm cool. agency yeah. Yeah. and yeah. To me, I mean, I very much focus when I work with companies on the team level because the most flexibility happens on teams, right? You can work for a giant company that says you have to be in the office Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but most teams are like, eh, you know, <laughs> and I think that's great, right? Because you, ha you, have, you have the most opportunity for flexibility, for psychological safety, for all the good things at the team level, even if you're in a system that isn't great, which frankly, most companies are not. And so I think that's important also for your listeners to think about if they don't, uh, maybe your audience might be more leaders and CEOs, but for a lot of people, you know, if they have some level of agency within their own colleagues, what can they do? And I think it's also about having those really wonderful questions that, that so we have, we have a, we've tried to build a fantastic culture and but a fantastic culture is, is a number of authentic actions, right? That people believe from the top down. And one of the things that we say in the business, we get our teams to ask each other all the time is, um, Within your role, within your job, what do you love? Yeah, yeah. And and what do you not? And what do you not love? So they'll write down what they don't love, and we say, "Well, stop doing them then." You're not allowed to do anything you don't love, because one of the things that that we operate, which is Patrick Lencioni, um, these principles of the six geniuses, which identifies what frustrates people versus what energizes people. Right. So, uh, and I get, I always use this as an example. I apologise if I've heard this before, but. One, as a simplistic example, one of the things I hate in my role is doing my expenses. Right? I put pins in my eyes before I do my expenses. Right? Um, and I just tried an example as we went on this journey. And there was four people in my team that were finance people who said, we love doing expenses. Oh, my God. Can we do your expenses? <laughs> right? And that was the point to, to say, trust me, because people are different and want different things and get energized by different things. Um, you know, finance people love numbers and number crunching and, and details and assets and, and, and uh, you know, all this different stuff. Um, there's things you don't love. There will be somebody in your team or even in your organization that loves what you don't love. Yeah. So, and it's like I use the football or in the UK soccer for, for Americans, but we use the football analogy that if you have a striker that scores hundreds of goals, you don't put him in goal. Right, you no. play them in position. You play them in the place where they're best suited. Listen, right? as a volleyball so player can... who's six foot two, <laughs> I, I, I wasn't in the back row very much. <laughs> <laughs> but but again, you know, so for me, it's when you can truly drive these messages that says you are not allowed to do what you don't love. You've got one job. Go and find someone in the organization that does love it and then work with them to manage that situation. Because then you're taking away all these negative elements that goes, well, I wish I didn't have to do that. Well, don't. Find someone else that would love to do it. And and you take people on that journey, but it's got to be repetitive. It's got to be consistent. Um, and it's got to be revisited because that's how you keep the momentum going. So little things like that builds trust in an organization. I love that, right? I mean, it's funny. I try to do that with my kids and their chores. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right? Like, is there a chore that you don't mind doing? And and yeah, um, yeah. yeah, it's a, it's about agency. And and the other thing that also I think is really important because I I work with a lot of really sort of classically high achievers, right? People who went to the fanciest law schools or the fanciest business schools or medical schools. And and what I find with them is that they might be into their thirties before they realize. I don't really love what I've been excelling at on paper for 15 years. <laughs> I can't tell you how many lawyers, right? How many lawyers I've worked with and met who've been like, man, I don't actually think I love this. And then, and then you have some real questions. I also use other tools. We talk about ikigai. So the loose meaning of ikigai, it's a Japanese term, is the meaning of life. And it's about how do you help human beings achieve the ultimate reason for being on a planet, and that is fulfillment. How do you help someone achieve fulfillment? And fulfillment is different things to different people. And it asks four simple questions. What do you love? What are you good at? What difference in the world are you going to make? And can you get paid for it? 
because you need to be sustainable. That's right. Now, you ask an 18, an 18 year old student coming out of school, they won't have a clue because they've not gone through life's experience, right? But if you're 30, 35, 38, 40, maybe, you really have a great opportunity to understand what it is that's going to drive you to the end game, whatever that end game is. And, uh, and my um, unfortunate element is that I didn't discover it until 10 years ago. So I missed out on an awful, awful lot of opportunity. But, um, but for me, I'm very, really, really clear on what's going, to, what's going to make me happy by answering those four questions. Um, now, you can't do it in a weekend. You know, some of this will take you a year because you've got to really dig deep, deep about what is it I truly love? What gets me out of bed punching the air every day? People want autonomy, mastery, and purpose, right? They clearly have to be able to put food on the table. That goes about saying, but no one jumps out of bed saying, I'm being paid a shitload of money. Um, and if they did, it wears off very quickly. And it's no different to if you have somebody that's I don't know, frustrated or concerned or upset, they're not progressed, or whatever the reasons why people draw or drive a monetary outcome. The money is something else. It's a sticky plaster for a bigger problem, right, where yeah. money is going to potentially solve the problem for a very short space of time. You give somebody a pay rise and – they're really excited. They tell their wife, their husband, their, their, their family. Um, but I'm up like they've forgotten about it because now it's just normal, right? That That is moved on. So money is usually a sticky plaster for a, a deeper rooted challenge that they're having, to, they're having to manage. And it's about taking the time, effort, and care to have the conversation, say, what's really going on? What, you know, what could we actually do to help you solve the real root cause, which money will only put a plaster over for two, three, four, five weeks? As the bard said, more money, more problems. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but then people say, please give me more problems. <laughs> but, but again, it's interesting on people's behavior, what really matters. And I've, had, I've got so many examples in our business where something similar has happened. And, we have, and you sit down and you talk to somebody and you find actually it's got nothing to do with the money. It's to do with some other problem that they're struggling to work out a solution, but they think money will buy them a bit of time. But it actually still doesn't solve the problem. And you think, well, how about we focus on solving a problem? They go, okay, well, how do we do that? And the first idea is go, wow, you've just taken all that stress away because now we've solved the problem and you ain't going to give me a pay rise. Not that you shouldn't give people pay rises, yeah. No, I, no, no, of course, of course. Of I course. mean, I think that that's often true. I think that part of, maybe, I mean, I work with people who have a lot of anxiety and, and in my own life, my constant struggle is that I hit all the goalposts and the anxiety doesn't go away. And so then you really have to do the hard work of what else is going on. I mean, I've hit, I've hit all the marks for passion. I, I mean, nobody has more passion for their work than me. I love it. I feel blessed. I'm doing exactly what I want to do every single day. Like yeah. what a gift. Who gets to say yeah. that? I don't know. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah. It's a gift. It's a blessing. And yet, the anxiety is still there. And, and so my book, The Anxious Achiever, is really about that conundrum, which I see in so many people, especially high achievers, where the passion is there, the metrics are there, but the anxiety doesn't stop. And so they can never sit still and say, wow, I'm so blessed. Wow, I did it. <laughs> and And that's that's a reality too. But I find that fascinating because I, I, I'm also blessed because I feel like there is there is nothing can improve in my life. I'm the best I can possibly be, and that's wow. that's not by design. That's by luck and circumstances and people run the business, all the rest of the things that have the great people around you. So I'm fascinated by people that are high achievers, do well, are happy in their life, passionate. But what is that one thing that's eating you away? And why is that happening? You know, and, and what can you do about it? Those sort of things fascinate me. And when I, in my peer groups, we have people in similar situations and we have the, the great opportunity to really dig deep and try and understand why they feel the way they do. Yeah. And invariably, it is something that's an anchor point that goes back not a week or a month. It goes back years. There's something clinging onto them from years and years and years and years ago that is buried far back in their heads and they don't even know what it is, but there's a trigger somewhere. And of course it means, well, when you think that, then what, what can you do about it? What can you do to release that trigger? Um, and, and yeah, and again, it, it is fascinating that, you know, there's things in life we don't know and, and the gold boy would like his first seat to understand what is it that's triggering? What is making you do that? But, uh, but I do find it fascinating because the best thing you can do for me is that if you've got people 
that are struggling. You've got people that are facing the challenges. I mean, we're coming up to Christmas now where most people are worried about the cost of Christmas and repaying it over next year and all the various other bits and pieces. What's interesting is to be out sitting and talk, you know, team talk about it. You know, what what is it you're doing? Why are you doing it? Um, and there's nothing more frustrating than spending a fortune on your three year old child's presents and then they spend the entire day playing with one cardboard box. <laughs> right, but it's expectations, it, right? Like, what are course, what are course, my expectations? Yeah. What do I think my kids' expectations are? What does being a good parent, right? I mean, we all want to be good. We want to be good parents. We want to be good children, good workers. And so you're right. And that's why that's why I think therapy is one of the best leadership tools there is, because I guess the extreme example is when you look at the, the billionaires, you know, and you always read about these hedge funders who are worth hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, but they get into these these petty feuds and then they won't stop and it's never enough. But there's there's a lot of people around who aren't billionaires who are going through something similar. And so that is that's a really illustrative process to go through if you feel like that's you. There's one question people don't ask with their colleagues, their peers, even their family. There's one question we are so scared to ask, and that is, what could I do better? What am I not, do- what am I not doing well? We're so frightened of that question, yet it's the most powerful question you could ever ask because it really gives you insight. I hate that and question. It- <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> which, proves, which proves my point, right? That's it's the one thing that everybody's frightened of. You know, it's so funny. I was just thinking about it's the end of the year. I like to set goals. I'm a big forward. I like to reflect and then set goals. And I thought, you know, I think my goal in 2024 has to be soliciting more feedback because, you know, after you give a keynote and you get that email from the event person with your scores, (laughs) sometimes I get get so anxious. Sometimes I'm just like, I'm just not going to read it. And, And what is that about? Right. So, um, yeah, that is, that's my goal. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. So let me just ask you, um, let me just ask you one question. See if you can think of one example, good example. The whole purpose of this, this podcast is to try and solicit scenarios where people did the opposite of what any human being would have normally have done, um, and achieved an incredible result. So is there anything that jumps to mind in your journey um where the world would assume you'd have reacted this way but you chose to do something entirely different that went against the status quo that took you out of your comfort zone but had incredible results um it's hard for me to say i've done something well being an anxious achiever but there's one thing i've done well and i'm going to share it because i i think there's probably a lot of working parents who listen to your podcast and if not they will share it hopefully with working parents which is that you know for women at least you're raised with the expectation that you cannot possibly have a really active parenting life and a really successful career it's an unwritten rule and certainly you know for really, you know, if you go to elite schools, if you're prepared, if you're just gunning your career or whatever you do, right? There is an unwritten rule. You can't have it all. Work-life balance. And I had the very good fortune when I, my first son was a baby to go to a conference and meet a woman named Callie Yost, C-A-L-I-Y-O-S-T. I recommend her work for everyone. She's America's leading expert on high performance flexibility, workplace flexibility, but she has coined a term called work-life fit. And she said, look, work-life balance is bullshit. And we all know that. Everyone has their own work-life fit. And you need to know what is yours. What's going to make you happy? If you're a mom and you have a baby and you actually are dying to go to work, that's your work life fit. You could do it. And I, I I met her and I read her books and I thought, oh my God. And I, from day one, have refused to fall into the trap that you can't be an active parent and have the career you want. And I had to do it on my own. No corporation was going to help me in that. I started my own business. And from day one, everyone I worked with and hired and me 
We had total flexibility. We worked virtually. We never were accountable for our time as long as we did the job well. And there were whole weeks when I wouldn't work. But I had such a great team. This is probably similar to what you, you know, I had such a great team. And when I needed to, I worked like crazy, but I I made my own rhythm. And I, and that was the biggest blessing of my life, but it came from this fundamental belief that I am not going to subscribe to this horrible, limiting untruth that we tell women, which is that you cannot have the career you want and be an active mom, because that's a terrible way to live your life. And I, I completely agree, but it also does play into husbands and fathers as well, to a lesser extent, but it, it has an so. I'll give you an example. The bit I loved about the outcome of COVID and the choices we made as an organization was we said, look, what are the things, just look at some basics. What stresses people out or a bit husband or the wife? Well, the husband or the wife saying, can I to their boss? Can I leave early? I've got to pick the children up from school. My wife's held up or my husband's held up. Um, well, will you be able to work this evening? Yes, yes, I'll get it sorted. Okay, fine. So it's a challenging question. The next day, the husband is stuck in London. They can't get back to the kids. The wife has now got the stress of saying, I've got to ask the boss the same question two days in a row. Oh, my God. Stress, right? So stressful. And so the first thing we did, because we went on this journey of complete change, is we said, we will fire you if you do not pick your kids up, right? We completely changed the statement. And what then happened was suddenly you've got the women, typically women, there's a few guys who are stay-at-home dads and stuff, but... Typically, the women would say, um, don't book me any meets before 10 o'clock because I've got the school run. Don't book me any meets between 2.30 and 3.30 because I've got the school run. It's a written rule. Nobody, nothing challenges them because they're the rules, right? You you look after the people that need to look after their families. And then, of course, they're picking the kids up at 3 o'clock, which would normally be pick the kids up, drop them home, run back to work, get all these things done so the governor can see I'm back at work. Say, no, 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 no. When you get your kids home, you get them ready for soccer practice. You take them to soccer practice. You do their own work. And if you've got time when the kids have gone to bed to, to do some of the things you want to do, then by all means do it. But we don't care. What we care about is you're achieving the outcomes that we all agreed and negotiated for the end of the month, and you do it as and when you help you see fit. And that changes how people feel about the anxiety every day in their lives. It, it changes everything, you know? Uh, and and um, And the most powerful thing you do, and again, I think this is one thing I did well, is I would totally say to my clients and my team, I can't. I have this obligation for my kid. I can't. My mother is going, you know, and and by sometimes by just saying the words, you open up the opportunity to take away the stigma and let other people do it too. But there's so much stigma and anxiety. And I mean, all of us know that horrible, horrible feeling of when the school calls and you're on the meeting and you're texting your husband saying, oh my God, we have to go pick the kid up, but I'm on this Zoom. And it's like the anxiety, the stress, the cortisol. And yeah, yeah, and, and you're, you're yeah. saying, what if that just wasn't necessary because we're all grown yeah. up and we're going to get it done. Yeah. So just to bring things to life, it's like you know, I was talking to Gabby today and her kids are running in saying, mommy, 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 mommy. And three, four years ago, you'd have gone, no, no, you can't, no, you don't work. You can't have children. And it was all this nonsense. Whereas now what's happening is because we've become more intimate with our colleagues, that we care about the children, the dog, or the thing. And we love the kids to come and sit on a lap and say, oh, this is Jeff, or this is Gabby, or this is Sam. Have a chat. And, and again, suddenly there's none of this fear about, oh, I've got to lock the door. I can't let you in. I'm on an important call. And we're saying, no, those days have gone. You are in a call where you are. We are families, right? And that's that's the way it works. And I think suddenly that again removes another level of anxiety when you know you're worried about your kids posting it. You know why? Yeah, it's real life, right? I mean, sometimes you are. Yeah, and that's okay. I mean, that's the other thing is that like sometimes I, I can't tell you how many nights I've been stuck on the tarmac at LaGuardia Airport in New York City. You know, I mean, that's life, right? So none of this is perfect. And that's the other thing is that no, I think no. that we have to also teach people to accept compromise. And Damn, compromise is so important in life. And again, when you're high charging and you have such ex- expectations, right, 
no, life is not about that. Life is about compromise. And um, the older I get, the more I feel very strongly about helping younger people who've always pushed so hard to just accept that sometimes things suck. Um, yeah. <laughs> sometimes they really do. <laughs> they do. They do. Yeah, they do. They do. Um, and that's okay too, right? You can still have you can still have the larger passion. Yeah, and I, I guess the other thing as well is how we use all in wired then as we've gone through schooling and, and education that um it's also about you know what do i get out of life you know what how do i benefit from this and it's like well why don't you change the question why don't you the question should be how do i help you and there is no cost to me help you, you i'm not going to help you provided you do this for me then you know that's that's not how it works so then the fundamental principle is whatever i want to do or, or whatever i want to achieve for the benefit of others am i creating a win-win yeah, there can never be a win lose, right? So if if whatever the compromise is, how do we ensure that we both benefit? But we've got to get people to be brave enough to do it. That's generalized reciprocity, right? There's a whole and, social science and, around it with social capital theory. And um, I was lucky enough at Harvard to take Robert Putnam's course. I don't know if 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 if, re- if listeners have ever heard of Robert Putnam and his book Bowling Alone. I really recommend it, but. His his basic point and the point of social capital theory is just what you said. You know, it's the golden rule: do unto others. And we, as teams, during the pandemic, I think we did that naturally because we were all in it. You know, we, it was the first time I think a lot of us felt we're in this together, and we're going to give each other grace and space, as my friend Laura Mays says. And I and I want people to remember that now. The, the other thing that and COVID taught so much, apart from the, the bad elements of COVID, which obviously was, was horrible. terrible. But when, when you look at the things that we learned as a result of COVID, I'll never forget our managers after a couple of surveys come back to us and said, um, I now know my teams more intimately than I've ever known them in the five years I've been working with them in the office. Yeah. Because you suddenly started having these intimate conversations that was forced by the environment and Zoom and one-to-ones and, and seeing the kids and the dogs and asking questions about their lives, stuff that you never ever did. It was just sort of pointless chat at the coffee machine. So, and what was lovely is as a result, you became more intimate. You became more intimate in caring and understanding about people's whole lives, not just what they did on the spreadsheet of their desk. But let me ask you a question, Jeff. So for all the many thousands of people who are saying, okay, fine, but hybrid work is difficult. It is harder to manage teams. I'm feeling, you know, I mean, What's your advice there? Because because I, I there's a dark side to this, which is that um, we have no boundaries between work and home anymore. The workday has shifted to a 24 hour cycle, which means that many people feel they they're never they're never off; they're always on. Um, people sit on Zoom all day long, and and you know there's downsides to this too. So how do we find the balance? Well, that's a great question. And it's a question that I took very seriously from the very get-go. So this also comes down to cult- culture, leadership, driving from the top. So in our world, you are not allowed to have back-to-back Zoom calls. It's forbidden. Um, you have to have a one-hour gap between calls. It's wow. mandated, right? And you must, if you're on a Zoom call, you must break every 40 minutes for a 10-minute, get some fresh air, switch off, walk away. Mandated. And um, and the other thing that we also do in lots and lots of uh, arenas is um, anybody that works a period of time, for some people it's eight hours if they've got kids, some other people it's 12 hours, some people might say, well, I'm happy to work 15 hours, I live alone, I've got nothing else to do, so I enjoy it, right? So there's all these different people want to do with things. But what is clear is you say, tell me what works for you and what doesn't. And what doesn't work for you means you're not allowed to do it. You say some. These are the rules, guys. This is about your health, your mental health. This is this is more important than anything you're going to do in a day. The key is no one cares what you say; they care what you do. So your leadership team have to behave in exactly that way every day, so that people will understand that it's that important to the business. What you can't do is have a leader working 24 hours a day, um, demonstrating that they are having back-to-back calls because that then just it all collapses. So you have to you have to live your values every single day. And then the people will then live those values every single day. And then you don't get burnout. 
That's exactly right. right. And, and you, you have to set expectations. You, you say clarity, I say expectations. Right. I, I think that's what's happening is, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm work, I work with companies where I, 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 I spend days with them. They're literally in back-to-back meetings. They don't have time for their work. And so they do their work in the off hours. They're not moving. They're scrunched into little boxes. I mean, the other thing is, you know, there's a tremendous toll on our physical body. Of course. Yeah. And Hence so why you, 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 you have to get up and walk away for 10 minutes every 40 minutes. You have to have an hour's break in between meetings, one to digest what you've just heard, two to prepare for your next meeting and keep yourself time, drop your shoulders, breathe. But these are just basic principles. It, nothing, none of this is, is like, this, none of this is like rocket science, but it's about having the courage to do things differently. Right, we're coming to the uh, we're coming to the the end of this, um, Maura. It's been it's been fan- I know it would be fascinating conversation and a real easy flowing but meaningful. But I've got two questions for you, and I, w- I don't want you to ponder on this, and I don't want you to, I don't want you to get anxious over them either. But this is about from the heart, right? So if there was one message that you was going to put out to the audience, you could only have one. What would you say you were most grateful for? I'm most grateful for my family. My husband, Fantastic. my kids. Yeah. Yeah. Which which give you that happiness every day, right? And that's what it's all about. Absolutely. Okay, the second question, the final question. If there was only one message that you could give out, what would be the one piece of wisdom or advice you would send out to the audience? Pause. Like you just did. <laughs> Do just don't be scared to pause, do nothing, take a beat, breathe. Love that. Right, Maura, listen, absolutely loved it. Loved it last time we spoke. Loved it even more today. Really felt like we, we were connecting all the way through that whole journey. So really, really enjoyed it. And I hope that path cross again soon. And um, thank you very much for, for taking the time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was some conversation. Thanks to Maura um, from across the pond, who was, uh, it was eight o'clock in the morning. She had to lock herself in the cupboard to keep away from all the kids getting ready for school, bless her. Um, but I've spoken to Maura before, uh, which you know, I really enjoyed that conversation, which is why we invited her onto this podcast, because she's, she's not one of these people that theorizes why people are anxious or going through depression. Um, it's something that she lives and has lived, you know, a big chunk of her life. So this is something she's talking about from knowledge, not from uh, academia. And to listen to the stories, to listen to the various scenarios that she identified, what people are missing, what companies are missing, what leaders are missing is flexible working, working from home is not about doing eight hours sitting on a chair in front of a screen you know that's that's not what it's about it's never been about that which is why you've got this foggy understanding about you know flexible working home working hybrid working because we've not got the basics right the fundamentals of what that actual working day looks like and if you don't get those basics right those gu- those guardrails if you don't get that clarity right then you do get chaos, you get anarchy. And I think some companies that have not realised the value of getting those guardrails in place um, are going to have anarchy. And then they're going to query or challenge the effectiveness of hybrid working or, or home working or flexible working. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Uh, my podcast uh, website has had a massive refresh. I'd love you to go and have a look at it and give us your feedback. Um, and of course, you can listen to all episodes. There's no cost on your favourite podcast platform. Or of course, you can watch the actual video of the podcast on on the YouTube channel, details of which are in the show notes. I guess I would love to also give a real good thanks to do this every episode, but to really emphasise this, that my team, Nicola Crawshaw um, from Cloud FM, um, Gabriella, uh, who works very closely with me on on the podcast, acquiring the guests and getting the guests ready, um, and Thinking Hat, who promote the podcast for me which is brilliant and of course you know the producers have produced this incredibly high quality production um what goes on media and um and the team that are essentially 
uh, Sam for her uh, a Michael Blade's incredible job. So thank you so much, um, and I can't wait to catch up with you all again. Uh, thanks for listening. <laughs>